This is Continuum Drag, a weekly podcast for visiting television, sci-fi, fantasy, and everything in between. This week, Earth 2, episodes 12 and 13. Night 66 on the planet, and the nights keep getting longer. Our new winter camp kept out the snow, but not the cold, or the dark, or the voices we heard in our sleep. Welcome to Continuum Drag, the podcast that's finishing what it started. I'm Luke, here with my co-host Jordan. What's real, Jordan? That is what's real. We are finishing what we started, which is Earth 2. And let me ask you this, Luke. Doesn't it feel a little bit like we're coming back to see an old friend, like someone from high school we haven't seen in years and years? And it's like, in one part, it's really nice because you haven't seen them in a long time. But then you also realize you have nothing in common anymore. (laughs) That's how I feel about this show. I was honestly... As soon as it started, I'm like, oh, I got to really remind myself what's happening. It's been a long time. I have on my notes, I wrote down all the characters' names because I couldn't remember what any of their names were. Yeah, that was a big thing, too. When I started, I'm like, oh, I got to pull up the IMDb because I'm like, who's that person's name again? <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's been a while. It has been a while. And uh, for those who don't remember, we've watched the first half of Earth 2. And we're coming back to kind of watch, see if we can get through the second half and finish it off. Um, Jordan, do you know what our series average for this was when we left? I'm going to say five. I think it's right on the uh, right on the edge. I mean, it's pretty close. It's 5.86 is where we left it. So we're coming in at a very middle middling show right now. So Mm -hmm. I I didn't realize it was so low when we left. We've never done this before. Watched a long show and then um, watched half of it and watched some other things and come come back. And in some ways, this seems like Shakespeare, doesn't it? Compared to compared to like it's Citizen Kane compared to some of the things we've seen. I will say we've watched some pretty low lights yeah. in between this. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. like it really has put into stark relief like how much worse television can be. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, I, I did notice that as well. All right, Jordan, uh, before we begin, we should do a little segment about Earth 2. Yeah, it's funny. We were talking this week and you mentioned to me that we I should do a, uh, a reading of some fan fiction. And at first I was like, oh, no, is there going to be fan fiction out there? And then I forgot that. There's a billion stories of fan fiction. People who like this show really, really like the show. And more than that, they like writing about that show and specifically like having Devin and Danziger get married. Well, I mean, that's where this show's headed. So, On that note, I have a few stories. I'm going to give you the title and the description and you can pick which story you'd like me to read. This is always such a game of Russian roulette. Yeah, it really Any is. Any way it goes, I die. And I know one of them because they have ratings. Only one of these are all rated as PG, but one is PG-13. It's a little bit sexier. Oh, a little racy. I can't remember which one it is. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the first one. This one's called Excalibur's Chapel. And okay. the plot is, Devin is getting ready to say, yes, I do, to her knight in shining armor. Nothing can spoil her mood on this day of days. Or can it? Listen, I'm not choosing that one. Keep going. <laughs> I did actually read that one, so I could tell you what happened. This next one's called Five Years, Nine Days. And the description was, this is how, a Devin Danziger story. I don't know what that means. I don't know either. Uh, The third one option is, a love meant to be. This is a poem about Devin and John. Oh, we did have fun with that last poem, Mm -hmm. but keep going. This one's called Loneliness. And the description is, from Devin's point of view. Oh, I thought I was going to say, the description of loneliness is, it's killing me. (laughs) No. And this next one, I have a feeling this is probably where you're leaning, but not to pressure you. This one's called The Aliens, and it's the Tarian's perspective on their human visitors. <laughs> I mean, that's a good that's a good one. This one's called One True North, and this is they'd crash together in a different way, and everything has been different and yet the same ever since. Oh, and I do have a note. My note was this is the most adult one. Oh. So that is the one. And finally, set aside a short, bittersweet Devin and Danziger piece. Honestly, there's so many Devin and Danziger ones. The only thing that rivals it is Julia and uh, what's his face? Sabato Jr.? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a few of those. And almost all of them are them having a baby. I, f- I read at least five of those where they had baby. Gonna, those two have to have a baby. The other two have to get married. There's yeah, that's, that's exactly what people in this uh, the world of writing fan fiction want. Oh, Jordan, it's so hard to choose because I am afraid of all of them. Um, but I think we should give the people what they want. 
uh, let's do the uh, most erotic of them all. Okay. I think it was the the bittersweet one. Is that what they said? It's called One True North. Yeah. And while I'm pulling this up, let me just tell you the one you didn't want, Excalibur's Chapel, the one you said you definitely didn't want. I actually remember skimming through that and just I'll break down the whole story for you. Devin is walking down the aisle and at the end of the aisle, she's expecting Danziger, of course, and he's wearing full knight armor for some reason and his face is covered. And then when she gets to the end to get to marry him, he takes off his mask and it's Morgan. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know what a twist. Yeah, that's the story. An M. Night Shyamalan fan fiction. (laughs) Exactly. Okay. Well, let me read this to you. Hopefully it doesn't take too long. Fingers crossed. This one's called One True North. Devin was tired after a long day of attempting to keep New Pacifica together. Everyone had called it an early night at the first sign of rain, and she hadn't put up much of a fight when Yuli asked to sleep over at Yale's. That's a sign right there. (laughs) Truth was, she could use the break. Between the demands of motherhood and the demands of colonists placed on her, she barely had enough time for anything else and she missed the closeness of the journey across the planets to this new home. And even when she thought she was dying, they'd work together, pushed for the cure that brought her back to life, pushed for another chance at life with her in it, and he'd been there, holding her hand like a lifeline, willing to own life into her, begging for her to open her eyes. That might be an episode we haven't come to yet. Yeah, I was going to say, maybe a spoiler? She'd never seen blue like that before. Not even the crystal blue of the ocean could compare to the blue hues of John Danziger's eyes and it being her favorite color even before she had known it. What? She couldn't quite place her finger on when it happened, but there was no denying that it had. I don't know if it's the way you're reading this, but I have, it's like I feel inside like I'm on a roller coaster and I'm about to like go off the cliff and I'm <laughs> dreading every moment of it. <laughs> well, hopefully it's not my reading. She'd fallen in love with him and him with her, and even when they argued, their bond only strengthened. It only drew them closer and closer until one fateful night, just outside New Pacifica, they'd crashed together in a different way, and everything had been different and yet the same ever since. She didn't remember arriving home. Her body ached. She did her mind. What is that? No. She did her mind? I don't know. She didn't bother with the lights. She knew her home like the back of her hand. She felt her way to the bathroom, set the luma light to dim, and drawn a bath. They mean drew a bath, but anyways. She stripped down desperate to get out of her clothes that felt gritty with sand, and she slid into the hot water with a groan. She knew he was there before he ever made his presence known. He'd be following her, lurking in the shadows. <laughs> this is not okay. This is not acceptable. <laughs> a dangerous game of cat and mouse, one that neither of them had to play, but it felt truer this way. He slipped into the water behind her, cradling her against his naked torso. <laughs> no. his, his, his fingers slowly ran up and down her arm, careful to massage out the kinks and knots from the day. Not a word was spoken as the water gently lapped at their bodies. His touch sent, <laughs> his touch sent shivers up and down her spine. Once she was completely relaxed, she turned slowly. Their eyes met first, then their lips, then their bodies. All I'm thinking is they can't waste water like this. Remember that episode where they needed all that water? <laughs> No, actually, I think they're they're using... There's two of them in a bath, so they're, they're being more efficient with their water. Ah, uh, fair enough. <laughs> she straddled him, taking him deep inside her to a place only he was allowed. No. Their, <laughs> their bodies moved and swayed, sweat gathered against their skin, kissing the parts that their mouths couldn't reach. What? Kissing the parts that their mouths couldn't reach? Oh, it's the sweat. It's the sweat that we're talking about. And just when she thought it was over, it began again. Her body moved slowly on top of his. His hands were everywhere, unable to keep them in one place for very long. And how they moved from the tub to the bed, she couldn't quite remember. But he was above her, moving deep inside her, taking her to a place she only ever gone with him and crashing back down only returned to those places again and again. At the last ripple of pleasure ghosted up her spine, she felt him release his own. Her hands gently guided his head to lay against her chest as she wrapped her legs loosely around his body, her lips pressed against the top of his head. Words were never needed in these moments. He was home to her. He guided her safely there each and every night. When her world was crashing down around her, he was her one true north, the constant in the chaos, and that made all the difference. I'm going to let you in on a little secret, listener. Jordan cut out right as that story got real gross on the Zoom, so I didn't have to hear the end. (laughs) Only you did. (laughs) Well, you want me to reread the part where she wraps her legs loosely around his body? Uh, well, that's about where I lost my thread, and then I was so grateful that Zoom decided that was enough. <laughs> Is that our um, the sexy story we've ever read? I mean, I would say it was getting very uncomfortable for me, so uh, yes, I would say yes. <laughs> Is that because I took my shirt off while I was reading it? I mean, your nips were very hard. 
<laughs> Anyways, oh, I should mention that was written by Untapped Treasure. Good, good name. Yeah, and I mean, it wasn't. I mean, it wasn't badly written. I, I was feeling uncomfortable because it was erotic. <laughs> it wasn't that badly written. I'll agree. Then what if? Your reading of erotic fan fiction starts getting us more listeners just for the erotic fan fiction you read. Well, it's a lot easier for me, so I'm up for it. We'll have to change the podcast a lot, but like, this is what like makes it take off. <laughs> just be reading erotic fiction. I mean, it's like ASMR, I guess. I guess. <laughs> anyway, uh, thank you for that uh, story time, Jordan. You should have picked the one where the uh, <laughs> the aliens talked about their perspective. Or the poem. I might, uh, the last time we did a poem, people loved it. Mm. We'll see how they feel about eroticism. Yeah, I think people are going to love it. All right, Jordan, let's get into it. Here is the IMDb summary for episode 12, Better Living Through Morganite, part one. With narration by Morgan, the group finds a new remarkable substance, which he names Morganite. As Yale increasingly appears to become a danger to others, Morgan sets the geolock which petrifies a kilometer zone. And that was courtesy of R.W. Zimdapa. Ah, uh, Zimdapa. Let me ask you right off the, the bat, because uh, everyone listening, we're going to find out very soon. Episode 12 and 13 are a two-parter, mm-hmm. which actually works well for our podcast because we talk about the first and second part. Right off the bat, do you think this story, so the story of there's a special rock and Morgan tries locking it and the stakes of what's going to happen with that, do you think it justified a two-parter i mean i guess it technically speaking if i were to like lay it out there were probably there was probably a little too much story for one episode but maybe not quite enough story for two episodes i feel like the subplots are really added there to build these up a little bit because there isn't enough excitement for a two-parter that's my feeling anyway well fair enough i I mean it is funny because Obviously, the show is, like, serialized, but, you know, a little on the light side, a little on the heavy side. Like, it's kind of in that in-between area Mm -hmm. where the 90s are trying to find it. And this is, again, one of those places where I was like, oh, it's because of we're in 2020, looking back on a show 30 years old, where I was just like, I've... I'm like, I can't believe they're just rushing through this, like, let it breathe. And then I kind of realized, I'm like, oh, right, you could, like, a two-parter was kind of a big deal in the 90s. That was the closest mm-hmm. to, like, true serialization you got. So I, I, at first, was a little off-put by it, but then I kind of realized, like, it's it's more of a sign of the times than than otherwise. Well, let's start. We're in the camp, and the interesting thing we noticed right off the bat, or at least I did, is it's a Morgan narration. He gets the chance to narrate, and he actually does both episodes, I think. And he said something I'm sure you were interested in, that is, it's night 66 on on the uh, on the planet and i will note i believe when we ended earth 2 last time we had a discussion and i believe i said i did not expect it to still be winter i thought they just skipped past the whole thing but they are still at that geodesic dome it is still winter they've been there for 66 days i had to try to remember where we left off but for anyone listening they set up camp at some sort of like what would you call it like biosphere sort of thing they found and they've and they've decided to stay there yeah they'd found it it was set up by radical botanists and <laughs> oh, yeah uh, it was radical botanists i forgot <laughs> and that is where they were gonna spend the winter and you know what they're spending the winter there it turns out mm-hmm. um and what's also going on is uh Yale, who is a uh, former criminal whose mind has been washed to turn him into like a semi-cyborg uh, tutor of some sort, his uh, mind wash is starting to slip and he's like having nightmares, which manifest as his holographic hand projector showing like old movie footage. So what it is, is in this world, certain criminals, I don't know if all criminals, but maybe just very violent criminals have been essentially rehabilitated against their will in a way of like through like computerization and they now have to become tutors or I guess maybe other things that are also like some sort of you know quote-unquote subservient positions but what we learn as we go along is all of them over time have broke down it's a failed experiment and he is perhaps the last one or one of the last ones that are still running yeah, he he hasn't been decommissioned because uh, Devin has kept him alive because he used to be her tutor. Now he's her son Yuli's tutor. So we're finally seeing the end of Yale's mind wash hold, I guess. And he would have been really young as a tutor for her, huh? He must have been, yeah. Although we're going to get flashbacks to him before he was uh, with his actual memories. So he's the same old man he is here. Yeah, I know. That's funny. I wasn't sure why they didn't recast him because I'm assuming, let's say Morgan is mid-30s. Let's say that. So she would be, let's say 30 years ago, he was tutoring her and he was 
20 something at the time it's like he wouldn't look the same as he does now he's like 60 now <laughs> maybe in uh, his memories he can't remember what he looked like so he just yeah. sees himself as <laughs> maybe <old> maybe <laughs> um and there's one other thing i'm going to note that's been going on apparently while well, they've been at this camp is that they've been experiencing a series of earthquakes that have been accompanied by lightning strikes in the area uh we see one of them at right off the top but they do say like this has been going on on and off and it's very funny because when we see it in this episode the earthquakes this huge lightning strike happens and uh one of those uh i totally forgot about these characters but there's all these background characters in the show who have slowly started getting lines and mm-hmm. becoming like smaller character parts and uh magus that woman with the uh, i believe mushroom you described her as having a mushroom cut yes. yeah yeah <laughs> She, she tells Danzinger, hey, we should go uh, check out that lightning strike and see what's going on. I don't know if it's here, but they go to caves. He goes in and he comes out with what I liked is it just looks like a hot rock. It's like kind of like almost like a glass, like a glowing piece of glass. But what he says is, I've never seen anything like it. And I thought, you've never seen anything like it. It looks exactly like a rock. You have seen something like it. It's called a rock. They don't have salt lamps in the future. <laughs> I just like that he's like, I've never seen anything like it. It's like, of course you have. Yes, it's like a, it's like an amber look like substance, but it glows. And um, they discover that it's hot and it produces an energy source, but is not radioactive. And they're like, oh, well, this could be very useful. Our power supplies are dwindling. It's winter. We're getting cold. This could be like a resource that kind of helps us survive the winter here and maybe like helps power our vehicles or something. Who knows? This might be a bit of an aside. But for some reason, and I couldn't remember the previous episodes, has there been something else they found on the planet that sort of solved all their problems? Repeatedly. Remember that uh, the uh, Grendlers, the little, uh, the like five feet tall little goblin guys, mm-hmm. their saliva is a cure-all. Oh, that's right. Yeah. I knew there was a, a, a weird little thing this show likes doing is introducing something that eventually will solve all the problems. Well, what was interesting here is, too, they're talking about that. They're like, oh, well, this will solve all our problems. And uh, Yale, who's starting to break down, his enhanced hearing hears a sound coming out of the rock. So he starts freaking out about the sound. And he's, like, absolutely adamant that this group of people should not be messing around with these rocks all willy-nilly. And um, I believe he has a great quote, which is, uh, I'm going to read for you here, which I think is true of, of this group of people on this planet. But he says, it's a completely unknown substance. You people embrace every new thing without thinking. It's lunacy. I agree with him on that. It is funny. He's supposed to be losing his mind, but I was just like, that's a pretty fair assessment. Like, they shouldn't just jump on every new thing they find and start using it like it doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, But basically, with his outburst, they all agree. They'll get a few more samples first. They'll test it out. And Devin makes, like, a... It, it's part she needs to make this comment to push the episode to like the next scene for the joke but i was just like i don't know if i would ever think to do this but like they're looking at this new substance they're thinking about like how can we use it to save our community and devin's first point is she says but what are we gonna name it yeah <laughs> yeah and the end joke is that when morgan finds out about it but well both the morgans uh bess and i don't know what morgan's first name is I can't remember either. I feel like it's another M name, though. Anyways, it's Morgan. Eventually, they're going to call it Morganite because he thinks it's like a real business venture. Yeah, he he sees it as an opportunity. Um, we'd seen earlier in the series, they had found in a Grendler's cave a... Um, Geolock. Yeah, the Geolock, which uh, best comes from a mining background. And she knows that it's a thing you can do to basically petrify the earth for a certain in a certain area so that nobody can mine into it and take your, like uh minerals inside it's like uh, staking a claim basically in the future Mm -hmm. and essentially morgan's like well this is it this is our opportunity to stake a claim on this new world and like make our fortune now what do you think do you think he was fair in doing that i mean i know it's his character the character is supposed to be a weaselly sort of guy but do you think he has a point they have shown up to a new planet and they don't know if anyone's there or not except for those weird robot guys and they've said he's like i'm just you know claiming a stake do you think he was right to do that i mean it's a pretty it's, you're right. It's in his character. He's like a weaselly bureaucrat, and it makes sense probably that he would try to do this. I, I mean, I think it's supposed to be like a heel turn. I don't yeah. know. What do you think? Would you have done it? No, me no. I, but I think I'm interested to know if like, do you think this has aged badly? But I, I think it's maybe just his character. I think it's, you know, it's consistent at least. Yeah, I don't think it's necessarily aged badly. I mean, here's what I would say. I'm on this new planet. I'm looking to make a fortune. What do I do? I would definitely keep in mind where we found these rocks and then come back once we had reached New Pacifica and then lock it down. I just fill my pockets with them. You just sell them one by one. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, here we go. I I, I found it. 
I found his name. What's his name? It's uh, Morgan Martin. Oh, so they're the Martins, not the Morgans. Excuse me. I thought they were the Morgans too for some reason, but you're right. It's it's Morgan Martin. <laughs> so hold on. I, if I was her, I would have said it Martinite, not Morganite. He's naming it after his first name. His first name. That's weird. That is very funny. <laughs> um, maybe IMDb is wrong, though. Who's to say? No, I think you're right. I think it's Morgan Martin. Anyway, uh, before they make this claim, though, Jess, uh, sorry, Jess, Bess wants to go test out the machine because she's noticed the geolock's been leaking recently. They want to make sure it works. So we get a little scene where they head out into the forest, and we get basically a reminder to the audience how the geolock works as they set a little, like, 100 meter area and what it is is when you when you set it up you have to like set in how far you want it to go and how much time you want it to freeze for and then how long before it freezes and we get to learn like you have to run away because if you're standing in the area it freezes you will also be petrified within like everything below the ground gets petrified and apparently everything above the ground also gets petrified don't you think that's a bit of a design flaw i understand the purpose of freezing everything underground because it's a mining tool but above ground doesn't make any sense to me it did strike me as odd and i felt like it might have even been a slight retcon from the last time we saw they never implied that was the case before but you know it is it is more of a stakes thing and uh kind of two fun things happen around this scene the only reason i really bring it up this like reintroducing how a geolock works to us is uh one we get to see those little like one foot tall kobos aliens the ones with the like yeah, yeah, coma yeah. inducing claws we haven't seen them in it forever i never thought we'd see them again and then one just pops up and goes i'm here <laughs> Yeah, and it has, has nothing to do with anything other than they're like, just remember, guys, they're here in this world. Uh, we forgot we had this puppet in the truck. <laughs> <laughs> but I was happy to see them again. And uh, the other point is, which is very funny, is we had known this from when he got it originally. And it's just a reminder is that they found a geolock. Morgan Martin kind of as a bureaucrat has gotten good at like hacking through encryption so he can learn information. And he's been able to basically get the code to activate the geolock. But as they're standing over it, getting ready to test it, he's just best says out loud. She's like, I really wish you'd been able to crack the abort code. And he's just like, well, too bad I didn't. I'm like, there's some foreshadowing for you. Yeah, I know. You can see this from a mile away. And I think you probably could in 1995 as well. Like what the issue is going to be. Clearly, they're going to set off this thing and somehow it gets stuck in its path that's what this you know this a plot's gonna be yeah they really it really right now from this point on the episode i'm like who's gonna get frozen yeah (laughs) um let's pop back to yale for a second because he's breaking down dr heller is unable to help him because um the his problem is between the medical and the technology, like somewhere in between those two things, this is happening. And uh, cyborg science is a bit of a mystery. So they don't know how to help him. Yeah. If there's ever been a truer statement, cyborgs are a bit of a mystery. <laughs> um, but she does mention that uh, while she's working on him, that she's been looking at these rocks she's found. And she tells him that that sound you heard, Yale, it exists. It's below our, the sound of our hearing, but your hearing picked it up. And she says... It's not what she thought it was because she ran some biological tests on the rock and the rocks apparently have movement inside of them that is more similar to the uh, synopsises in a nervous system. Yeah, so basically, in one sense, these rocks are alive. Well, and this is episode we'll really get into it, but I don't know if you remember this. It was ages and ages ago when they first met the Tarians, Dr. Heller scanned them and said they were like animal mineral vegetable they were like all kinds of things she couldn't figure out their dna Mm -hmm. and i'm pretty sure at that point i postulated that this planet was a living thing yeah and i think this episode confirms that we're gonna learn that this planet is just like a living organism it's alive it thinks it communicates exactly the tarians are one of their organs (laughs) yeah that's a good way of looking at it i think they even say that at some point they're like an organ of the planet of some Mm. sort Anyway, um, so they're interested in these rocks still. Danzinger and the robot Zero have been going there to collect samples back to the caves. And I love seeing Zero, this robot, but I don't understand why Danzinger is so mean to it. Well, I, we've seen this in, in a couple shows. They want to add a robot character or android character or some sort of robotic character. And the human characters are mean to it. The one that pops into mind right away was... Um, what was that one we watched where the sexy teens were in space? Or Star Voyager. No. Oh, um, the other sexy teens. Yeah. Uh, Star Command. Star Command. 
do you remember they had it was the same thing they're like we have a robot character who does all our work for us and we're mean to him for some reason and i'm pretty sure we've seen it in a few other shows it's this weird unintentional trope that comes up which is like i guess it's supposed to be this thing of like we're disgruntled at technology for some reason that's the the theme or the idea behind it yeah danziger's got zero here collecting these pieces of mineral and at some point he tells the robot he's like be careful with those uh they're hot enough to melt mylar and zero like turns to him and says I'm 12% Mylar. Will I melt? And Danziger looked at him and was like, I'd be so lucky. <laughs> you know what's funny? Every time, for some reason, I have the opposite uh, feeling. Every time uh, Zero shows up, I stop paying attention. I just find him such an annoying little robot. <laughs> so I don't, I don't even catch the exchange. I'm like, oh, here you go. He's going to do something. Because they don't even know how to use him. They're like, oh, he's going to pick up rocks or something. I'm like, guys, you could use the robot for, for something better than that. That's why I didn't understand. Why does Danziger be more lucky? Like, then he'd have to do all the work he's making this robot do. It's true. (laughs) Anyway, um, while Danziger and Zero are in this cave collecting samples, uh, Bess and Morgan also head out to the cave to, like, do a little scouting on their uh, claim they're going to, like, place on this, on these rocks in this cave. And in in classic, classic Morgan fashion, they get to the cave entrance and obviously Morgan's too cowardly to enter a cave. So we have an exchange where Bess says, OK, I'll go in by myself, honey. And Morgan's is like, OK, I'll uh, I'll stay outside and make a business plan for us. And then she does. She goes in. Bumps into Danzinger. Yeah. She starts making up a story about how her dad was a miner. And so she's just here collecting rocks. And it's, you know, one of those classic comedy lying moments where she's just like, uh, besides Danzinger, there's not enough Morganite here to make it worth my while. And he's like, Morganite? And she's like, uh-oh. I mean, I did appreciate, though, that she pretty much came clean immediately. She's just like, yeah, yeah, yeah we're staking a claim to all this all this minerals. And Danzinger's like, oh, weird. Yeah. Danzinger basically is distracted because it's at this moment that, like, they bump into some Tarians in the cave. And we kind of see how this, like, Morganite's created. Especially the Tarians are in this cave as well. They're putting their two electric staffs together. And that lightning is shooting out of the sky somehow into the cave itself. And causing those earthquakes. And when that happens, all the surrounding rocks in the cave start glowing yellow. So this is kind of the Tarians appear to be creating the Morganite in the cave. Now, I have a question for you, Luke. And this is we're just going to have to guess on this. So what we're seeing is, is it a staff they're using to bring the lightning into the rocks? It's some sort of staff, right? Yeah, we've seen this staff before. This is the staff they used to zap people. But what we saw in a previous episode was that the way they were getting the staffs all zappy was by using the electricity water. Yeah. So they also use uh, lightning? They're very multi-purpose, these staffs. They can attract yeah. lightning. They can go into electricity water. They're very useful. Yeah. I think there's a little bit of uh, inconsistency there. I mean, I think they just fill whatever role is necessary. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. But anyway, this is basically to tell them. They see this. They suddenly realize these rocks are related to the Tarians. They head back to camp and basically inform the group of what's happening. Um, it's at this point that Dr. Heller, she posits the same theory we were just talking about that the Tarians, the planets are all one interconnected organism and this news basically affects Bess. She's just like tells the group we gotta leave these rocks alone what this says about this planet is important and like we shouldn't be messing with it if this is all one big organism and what I like though is that everyone else, Morgan included, but like everyone else in the group is just like no Bess, I don't think that's a good idea. We're still gonna look into it. Then no one takes her seriously I guess. It is the thing we've seen with Bess is at certain points in the show, she's been correct about what's happening, and they always dismiss her. I think it's probably her association with her husband. I think that's probably true. Um, let's go back to Yale, because this is kind of where the episode's headed for him. Is uh, Danzinger's worried about Yale going crazy. Everybody's noticed that he's starting to go a little more berserk every day. And um, Devin doesn't really want to do anything about it, so he gathers a posse up behind Devin's back to like be like if you know essentially be like we're gonna have to kill him if he goes crazy so everyone needs to be prepared okay I you know what I'm gonna stop there I'm gonna defend Danziger because I'm on his side remember in the history of this world in the show these guys all go crazy and become very violent Yale is past where he's supposed to have broken down he's acting really crazy as they all do they're in a close quartered place where it's becoming very obvious he's going to become unstable and violent and the leader refuses to do anything about it because of how she feels about him and she doesn't even want to have the conversation so yes he does go have a conversation off to the side because she's already decided she doesn't want to have a doesn't want to talk about it 
And to be fair, I think it's a pretty civil conversation. They're like, he even says, he's like, look, I don't want to kill Yale, but all 40 of us are worth more than one little robot with a robot hand who can't stop, you know, making jerking motions. <laughs> I don't disagree. I, I think they are uh, on, on well within their rights to be doing this. But uh, I also think Devin sucks as a leader, right? We've seen this before. She sucks. She should not be the leader. My, I think my only real uh, drawback for more or not for Morgan for Dan Zinger and how he runs this meeting is uh, he brings them all together in secret in that geodesic dome. But he doesn't even bother looking around the geodesic dome. And uh, Devin's literally like sitting in the other room listening in on his conversation. <laughs> it's true. If you're going to have a secret meeting, always check all the doors. Yeah. Don't, you know, don't just walk in the room and start talking. Someone might be in there. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, Devin's starting going to start coming around to this idea that maybe Yale's too far gone when we cut to a scene where Yale's trying to teach little Yuli his like daily, uh, daily, I guess, school lesson. And uh, Yuli's being a very annoying little brat running around just shrieking while ignoring Yale as he's working. And Yale finally loses it and grabs Yuli and shakes him and says, shut the fuck up. And I like it because obviously it's a scene where he looks like he's lost control and he's never been, uh, he's not really violent, but he's been slightly physical with the kid and scary and it's inappropriate. But as a viewer, man, like I've been wanting to shake that kid every episode. He's super annoying. Well, and he was being very annoying in this scene. (laughs) Yeah, and it's like, I'm actually not sure I, th- I think the point is that we as a viewer are supposed to be on Yuli and Devin's side, but I wasn't because he's so annoying. Yeah, I mean, it was supposed to be a moment to show that he's come too far, like he's gone too far. And like, yeah, I mean, picking up a child and shaking it may be a little much, but like uh, that kid was asking for it. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I would have um, rather he took his robotic hand and just grabbed him by the head and just popped it. <laughs> what a way to go. Yeah. Uh, but at this point, Yale also is just like, I, I'm gone too crazy. I can't be here. He like basically bounces off into the woods to run away. We see him basically having a breakdown and we finally, we've seen flashes of a memory he's been having, but we finally kind of see most of the memory and we see what I guess we're supposed to know of Yale's history is he was on some sort of like military hit squad that was sent out to execute all those radical biologists from earth who were trying to build all these bio <laughs> geodesic domes. So he was like part of a massacre of these scientists. Yeah. And, uh, this is basically it breaks Yale. He sends a note back to camp saying like, I'm leaving. I'm never coming back. Don't come looking for me. It's essentially a suicide note, but he's just like going off to the distance to die. Like he's a cat. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And of course, like, as soon as they get the note, they're like, we gotta go find him. Which is funny, because they say that, but they sure didn't want to go find Julia. <laughs> That's true, they left her behind, no problem. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's at this point that uh, Morgan is finally like, I need to get that Morganite. Bess is now not going to help him. She's like, we can't do it. We can't lock down that earth. We, we don't know what it th- means to the Terrians. We can't do it. And Morgan's just like, listen, I'm going to do it without Bess. She's going to thank me later. And he heads out into the woods with his geolock shoves it in the ground and in classic morgan fashion he's just like i don't know how big to set this for what's your maximum geo lock it's like i don't know a kilometer he's like right let's lock a kilometer down i don't know give me 20 minutes to get away and of course it's much much too big for the area he could have just said like like here's one thing we didn't learn about the geo lock i don't know if because what it looks like it's like a tube you stick in the ground but it wasn't clear if that tube has multiple uses they have multiple tubes, I think. Yeah, because what I would have done is just like, all right, give me 15 feet. Oh, I can do bigger than that. I'll use another tube and make it bigger. Do you know what I mean? Like, I wouldn't have just gone for the biggest ever. It's like, how much salt does this recipe need? I don't know. I'll put the whole box in. Classic bumbling Morgan. <laughs> I guess, yeah. Um, and it also sets our, our ticking clock of 20 minutes till, uh, till the ground freezes. <laughs> yeah, but let me ask you. And maybe this is not fair because it's 2020. Did you feel any sense of urgency at all? No, of course not. I mean, no. this we'd seen this coming the entire episode. Like, we were just yeah. waiting for this moment to happen. Yeah, I think maybe that's what it was. If they had maybe held their cards a little bit, it would have had maybe more of an impact. But it was just like, okay, I know this is going to happen. And also, because it's this TV show, I know there's going to be no real repercussions. I mean, this is basically the only thing I was waiting for was this to happen. Because the countdown on this clock for me was like, who is going to get frozen. Like, we know someone's going to get frozen because they've set that up. Like, if you're on top of the ground, you're going to get frozen. Yeah. So I'm just waiting to be like, who's it going to be? And they whiffed it, right? I mean, we'll get to it. 
Um, but of course, he returns back to camp, goes to his tent, finds a note from Bess, and Bess is like, "Hey, Morgan, went back to the caves to do more surveying." And Morgan's like, "Uh oh, I gotta save my wife from the geolock." Yeah, so she's in the she's in the caves, and the ticking time clock is going. And of course, Bess is in the cave looking around. Who else is in the cave? Why it's Yale? They run into each other because he's just run off from camp. Well, they're in there. They see some Tarians, so they're hiding from Tarians together. I'm still not sure what we're supposed to feel about the Tarians because it seems like it changes from episode to episode. They still act like they're scared of them. Are they supposed to be scared of the Tarians? Or are they like, because there's been this sort of like maybe tenuous sort of agreement between them. But like there was that one episode where they like almost seem like like they're g- going to kill them. And I'm like, is that what the relationship is? It does feel like at this point, they well, they may not like understand the Tarians. I do feel like there's enough evidence to prove they're essentially nonviolent toward them. Right, but but this episode makes you feel like, oh no, they're in the caves too. We better hide from them. I'm like, I don't think they really care. Yeah, it is weird. They're still quite so terrified of them. Um, outside of the caves, Devin and Danzinger have been like looking for Yale as well. So they just happen to stumble across the geolock in the ground, mm-hmm. and this is when they get the. Inf- they basically also are informed by finding the geolock. Uh oh, Morgan has set a geolock to take up a kilometer of Earth. We better race back to the camp because the camp might be within a kilometer so we need to evacuate it yeah and i actually thought that was gonna be the interesting part i thought oh no he's gonna have like destroyed the camp but very quickly like this it goes off now um yeah. the geolock and we see it it is a large area and they're in camp sort of they pack stuff and they watched it but it doesn't come really anywhere near camp yeah i mean that sort of thing they rush back they evacuate the camp and they watch it but you're right it, it ends up not reaching the camp so the camp is fine then we cut back to the caves where morgan's found bess and yale and he's telling them, he's like, we gotta get out of here, the geolock's coming, but it's too late to come off. We see it creeping along the walls, coming toward them through the caves. And this is the point where we finally see something get frozen. As uh, as one unlucky Tarian, he uh, Kool-Aid mans through one of the walls, just busts <laughs> yeah. right out of it. And as he's halfway busted out of the walls, he's petrified into the wall by the geolock. And then the geolock like stops like three feet from Bess, Morgan, and Yale. And I was just like, oh, they didn't get anybody. Yeah, they got this one faceless Tarian. And basically, the Tarians now see that the humans have frozen them. And they're like, they ain't happy. And that's the cliffhanger. Yeah, that's it. Tarians are not pleased with what you've done <laughs> yeah, to yeah. be continued. You're right. That's basically what it is. It's not that they're angry. They're not too pleased. They don't have a lot of emotions, so it's tough to know what they're thinking. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they just come out and look at their frozen friend and are like, I don't like this. Yeah, they're like, that's interesting. I've never seen him do that before. <laughs> All right, let's continue on with the IMDb summary for episode 13, Better Living Through Morganite, part two. We are finding that it's impossible to learn about this planet without also learning about ourselves. Yale and I had both tapped into the vast intelligence that we now know is humming beneath our feet. It's an extraordinary new world, and survival is simply a question of whether we can reach deep enough to find the extraordinary in ourselves. With narration by Morgan, Mary appears with the Tarians, who want retribution against Bess, Morgan, and Yale. As the group struggles to break the lock code and restore the affected area, the sunstones reveal the truth of Yale's past. And that, again, was R.W. Zimdapa. I didn't need to see Mary anymore in her silly voice. I was impressed she came back, actually. I hadn't expected her. They are pretty consistent, for the most part, on this show about the world building they do. For the most part, they're pretty consistent. It is true. I, Mary, if you don't recall, she was an orphan left behind when evil Tarians killed her radical biologist parents and the <laughs> Tarians have raised her as their own. So she can come in and out of the ground just like they can. The only difference is she's like, la 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 la. That's how she talks. And she doesn't look like she's seen a brush for her hair in quite some time. <laughs> the episode begins on an archival newscast, I guess from back on earth on the satellites that everyone lives on. And it's yeah. a newscaster talking about how the Yales and the Yale program all go crazy and like get violent. Were you glad they showed us that to bring us up to speed seeing as they mention it 85 times an episode? I mean, I will say this. I wish that newscast was more informative. I still am more interested in what's happening back on the satellites. I would have loved to watch an entire episode that was just a satellite newscast. That would have been funny. But essentially, we just pull out and this is explaining what's going on with Yale. And for whatever reason, because Yale's brainwashing is breaking down, he just keeps replaying this newscast in his head over and over. Maybe it's supposed to be it's the only bit of 
memory or information he has of this attack. Yeah. And it's basically just to show him trapped in the caves with Best and Yale being held hostage by the uh, by the old Terrians who are very mad that they geolock the Earth. Mm-hmm. We then get, and I'm sure you enjoyed this, Morgan narrated voiceover recap of the entire series. It did seem like this was... Like, you know, it's been like a Christmas break or something, or the show has been off the air for a few weeks and they've come back and they're scared the viewers have gone. So they want to bring everyone back up to speed. That's what it felt like. Is that what the, what this is? Or is it just a random, by the way, we better recap people because this is so much information. I am not sure. Let's have a look. But I also was surprised partly because like I get having to do a recap like that makes sense to me. But doing it in the middle of two part episodes like it was such a weird place to put a recap for the entire series it wasn't like a recap of what happened last episode it was like a recap of what happened all season yeah it's a recap of 12 episodes and also no i'm looking right now jordan this came out a week later <laughs> it was so odd i felt the same thing it was just like why do they have this here but anyways it's there it was also interesting too because morgan's narrating it and the morgan who's doing the narration is way more self-aware than the morgan in the show like yeah. he's talking about how he makes mistakes and how he has to learn from them. But I'm just like, this is not the Morgan in the show. This Morgan in the show never learns from his mistakes. Well, this is something we've mentioned before. The narration on this show does not work at all. Not just for the reason you're mentioning, but the characters narrating sometimes are not involved in the things they're narrating. Thus, they wouldn't know what happened. They speak in a tone that's not the same as the character. And they also do these sort of grand recaps and summing up things that's not the moral or lesson we've learned. And I don't know why they are so desperate for this voiceover, but it never, ever works. Yeah, it's, uh, I could, like, you know, it was clearly part of the show engine at the beginning, and they're, like, really sticking to it. But you're right. It's just, they should just abandon it. I agree. Anyways. We uh, hop back to camp where the whole Eden Project's gathered together. They're talking about what they're going to do about their missing crew members who are being held by the Tarians. So at this point, the Tarians arrive with Mary. Um, she's kind of showed up to translate for the Tarians and explain, like, why they're holding them hostage. Um, but it's also weird because, you know, she speaks in that weird Tarian language that you d- that you were doing earlier in the episode. La, 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 la. Like that. Um, but she's also talking to Alonzo, who they set up Alonzo as their Tarian translator who goes in the dreamscape and talks to them. So what we have here is we have two characters who are supposed to be our Tarian translators talking to each other. And I was just like, one of these characters isn't needed. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna just further complicate things. I thought Alonzo could only communicate them with them through the dream sequence. So if he's not asleep or access that dream world, he shouldn't really understand. Am I wrong? Or is he he's learned what all the la 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 means? I'm not sure either because the Terrans never talk to him. Mary's just talking, and she's talking both in English and the Terrian language. And then Alonzo's translating both the Terrian language and the English to the group. And you're right. Like, what we know about him is he's that pilot on the, of the ship who gained a psychic connection with the Tarians, and that's how they first talked to them. But it's just so funny to me that now they have two translator characters, and it's quite clear in these scenes, it's like, oh, we have one too many translator characters. Also, does anyone trust that they're translating the proper thing? Apparently, everybody does. Yeah. Um, one thing they learn is uh, when the Earth was frozen for that kilometer, they apparently broke the dreamscape. So Alonzo can't go into this like dream world and talk to the Tarians. I mean, he can seems to be able to go into it. He goes into it later, right? Yeah, and it feels more like the Tarians won't talk to him. But there's some implication that what they've done is what they've frozen is part of the planet's brain. So the planet has a real bad case of brain freeze. <laughs> And it's messed up how the communication's working. This is, I guess, why they're so mad. It's like, uh, you know, it's like someone came to your brain and uh, gave you a Slurpee and forced you to get brain freeze. And you're like, dude, that was uncool. Yeah. <laughs> Luke, there's never been a better example. <laughs> but essentially, the, the breakdown is, at dawn, Tarians are going to execute Morgan, Bess, and Yale. I love that they said at dawn. It's like an old Western. Like, <laughs> we'll do it at dawn. At dawn, it's going down. Um, Mary returns back to the hostages. She basically informs them that uh, you guys are about to get executed. It's at this moment that Yale remembers more about his miscarriage, like, or not his miscarriage, uh, his miscarriage of justice, I guess. Uh, when he like, he's like having another flashback of him killing those radical botanists. So he basically runs up to Mary and whispers in her ear and essentially, I guess, tells Mary that he's solely responsible for the freezing 
So let Bess and Morgan go. And so they're now just going to execute Yale. This is his self-sacrifice, I guess. And I don't know why the Tyrians are into it, but they are. Because it seems like they had more of a bargaining tool with three of them, but whatever. Yeah, and also I was just like, it's such a funny thing. It's just like, it's Morgan is such a classic mediocre white guy. He like never has to face consequences for his actions. No, never. It's so silly, because even in this case, I'm just like... I could see Yale being like, let Bess go. She's innocent. But like, truly, there's never been a moment where he's like, you know what? I guess Morgan should stick around. Like, this truly is his fault. But say la Whatever. Vie. Uh, they both return to camp where they find the whole crew. They're discussing how to go into those caves and rescue the hostages. Danzinger's got an idea where they should take the other geo locks and basically threaten the Terrians with more brain freeze if they don't let them go. I was on his side when he was having the meeting in secret about Morgan, uh, sorry, about Yale, but I wasn't on his side for this. This seemed like, come on, Danziger, this is a stupid idea. Julie is there. She's proposing that this Morganite, which in this episode they've decided now is called Sunstones. They've renamed it in between episodes. <laughs> Sunstone. Um, she thinks that the uh, vibrations it's, it's producing might actually be a language and that maybe if she studies it, she could maybe communicate with the planet. That's her plan. Yeah. Also, I still don't know what kind of doctor she is. She's a doctor of it all, baby. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then when Morgan and Bess walk back into the camp and explain that uh, crazy old Yale's the only one who needs to die now, he like talked them into letting everyone go. Like literally everyone in the camp, except for Devin's like, oh, OK, cool. Then I guess mission accomplished. Yeah. Two birds with one stone. Like, uh, problem solved. And, like, Devin obviously gets so pissed off they're just willing to let Yale die. And uh, she makes this huge speech. And at the end of her speech, she says, Yale would have given her life for any one of you. And I was just like, yeah, he just did, yo. Like, <laughs> that he was just the point. sacrificed himself for everybody. That's the point. <laughs> and I don't know if it's here, Luke. I think it's later in the episode. And we could talk about more in a minute. But when we do see him by himself with the Tarians, they put him in... What we've seen before is how the Tarians die. They go to like back to the earth through. Yeah, that's that's how they're going to execute him. Is that how it works? Do, do humans get executed going into that dry ice? I mean, presumably you just would have no oxygen and you would die. <laughs> oh, OK, sure. That's my assumption. But they said it was a great honor. Aren't they honoring him by killing him that way? I will say there is. I did notice an inconsistency because in previous episodes going into the earth is how Tarians die. Like that's how they put Tarians who are too old. That's like their way of like letting them die is to put them into the earth again and when there were those Tarians who were rebels and exiled from the community they weren't allowed the honor of doing that so i was just like is this how you treat a person you don't like i bet maybe that's just how they're just like you know you have to be punished for this but we're not like so cruel we'll keep you out of the earth i don't know it, it did i did it doesn't question. really matter but you're right Yale ends up spending part of the episode back with the Tarians waiting, awaiting his execution at dawn. And what sort of happens here is he hangs out with that Mary character and they, you know, they do some stuff where he explains like human things to her, like faith and prayer and like asking for forgiveness. And she explains Tarian stuff to him like, oh, if you touch these glowing rocks, you can communicate with the earth. And it's sort of through this like he'll discover the truth about this is what was said in the in that synopsis like he'll discover the truth about his memories and what he did to become a yale basically he'll like touch the touch the stones and i guess the planet will unlock his memory yeah something like that and what we've seen it up till now is like flashes of him committing a massacre of radical botanists mm -hmm. but when we see the full memory what it is is he was on a squad sent to kill radical botanists and when he got there his uh, partner, I guess, there was only two people on this squad with him, was like, yeah, great, let's murder all these people in cold blood. And Yell was just like, no, I can't do it. I'm a good guy. So he killed his partner and saved the botanists. And so Yale is actually just a wonderful human being who's never done anything wrong. And I'm sure you, you thought the same thing, because the whole point is supposed to he has a turn now. So he goes, he doesn't want to die anymore because he goes, I'm not a bad person. I actually did the right thing. But immediately I thought, but you were on a death squad. N at no point did we say this was the first time you had done anything. And I'm assuming you signed up for that death squad yourself. Like you are a bad person. Just because this one instance you had uh, a moment of uh, 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 morality come through. It's like you're still a bad person. I don't know how that changes anything. I mean, this is just uh, I mean, it's a kind of classic for the era, but it's just a real cop out like 
we know these units are supposed to be criminals who had just something in the past. And like the more fun version of this is it's a person seeking redemption. But we, what we have here is a person who was never bad to begin with. Yeah. So like, like you said, like, why did he join? It's fun. They actually like throw it in at the end. He has some of his memories coming back and he's just like, I, I joined the elites, the elite squadron to pay for grad school. Oh, did I missed that line. That's funny. And I laughed so hard when I heard that. Um, but you're right, though. If it had been that he, through a series of experiences, realized the error of his past ways and has learned and become a better person, that's character growth. That's interesting. It's a little bit more challenging to write that and to show that on screen. But they went, no, you know what's easier? To have all of our characters never have anything interesting or difficult about them just in case we turn off the viewers. And it's like, well, so this whole point was nothing. Like the whole, the, his whole shutting down and all this problem, it, it, it amounts to nothing. Yeah, he was always a good guy. He was never a bad guy. So don't worry about it. And also he's breaking down. Don't worry about it. He's not anymore. Um, what I also like too is, yeah, you're right. When he discovers the truth of his past, he just starts screaming that he's innocent and not to execute him because he's a good guy. And the Tarians couldn't care less. Yeah, which I would too. If I was the executioner, I'm like, yeah, you know, we already put you in the smoke. <laughs> um, back at the Eden product project, um, we basically get to see like a three- Three or four tiered uncoordinated strategy on how to save Yale. Because <laughs> because they have bad leadership. I've said it time and time again. Devin and Alonzo take off, head to the caves because their plan is they're going to negotiate with the Tarians to let Yale go. They're going to go in. They're going to have a nice talk. They're going to talk them out of uh, killing Yale. The Tarians very quickly are like, uh, lady, we've met you and your species before. We know you don't speak for all of them. <laughs> And I think at one point, Devin says, you've trusted me before and I've proven I can be trusted. Is, is that entirely true? I mean, she helped them out once before, but I mean, it doesn't necessarily, like, you know, they're exacting punishment for a crime that was committed against them. I, I don't know. It, it doesn't quite work. Like, I get what she's trying to do. She's trying to be diplomatic, but like, she doesn't really have any leverage here to do that. They're like, hey, your dog murdered my cat. And she's like, yeah, but remember I gave you that casserole that one time? I'm like, yeah, but your dog still murdered my cat. Like, I, I don't understand her point. <laughs> well, it's kind of it's it's kind of an issue there. But I mean, their negotiations very quickly take a turn when Danzinger and a few heavily armed men storm the cave to threaten the Tarians in the middle of Devon's like peace negotiations. Sometimes I think they push Danzinger too far. I know they want to have this sort of. Uh, Uh, Will they, won't they with him and Devin and they see things differently and they've had a couple episodes where they've like taken a step forward to agreeing on things. But sometimes it's just like they need him to be this anti version of her and yeah, like a hothead. And what ends up happening is she seems really lame on one end and he seems really dumb on the other. Yeah. Devin uses this opportunity of Danzinger threatening them all with weapons and geologs to provide an example about how humans aren't bad by talking Danzinger into putting down his guns and showing them like see we can all get along yeah um it was a long way to go it was a long way to go and what's also interesting is the Tarians don't seem to care because for the rest of this episode they're just holding all of these people captive in a cave waiting for the execution to happen like neither of them made any point <laughs> it's just time wasting till we get to the real stuff um meanwhile Dr. Heller's back in camp she's been studying those sunstones she's been trying to learn the planet's language But what she's discovered is the stones are so intelligent that they've turned the tables on her and learned her language via English phrases she was using to try to, like, study it. I don't know why this bothered me, but it just seems so stupid. It's stupid. And the thing about it is, too, is, like, she implies that, like, the Sunstones have learned her language faster than she could learn its. But then she says... The information it's sending her devices are too complicated for her to understand. So I was just like, so how, if you don't, like, how do you know it's, I just didn't understand how she thought it learned her language if she still doesn't understand what it's saying. The only way this would have been funny, or I would have enjoyed it, is you suddenly saw one of the rocks and a mouth opened and it was like, radical. And then she's like, (laughs) it can't speak English. Then I would have liked it. That would have been pretty fun. Yeah. But... The final sort of piece of the puzzle to save the day is Morgan and Bess have concocted their own plan. They've headed back to the geolock and Morgan's going to try to hack the biolock six tier security code to uh, get the abort code going. And like 
it's very funny. Like at first he's doing it by hand and it shocks him every time. And then Bess, a volunteer, she's like, hey, can't you VR into the geolock instead of like touching it? And he's like, of course, I love VR. And I was like, oh, great. It'll be far more visually interesting to see him in VR <laughs> trying to hack something. And then they cut to VR and it's just scrolling numbers like it is on the screen of the geolock. And they go back to it time and time again. But, uh, you know, explain this to me, Luke. So they've tried to really sell that this rock is intelligent so somehow through a bunch of pointless dumb dialogue julia comes with the rock and somehow that connects to morgan and makes him smarter I'll, at I'll cracking explain the code. it to you i'll explain it to you it's stupid uh he morgan's smart enough to crack one tier but it's going to take him days to get through all six of them helen sh- dr heller shows up with these intelligent rocks to help and their thought is like we'll attach some device we have that scans the rocks to the geolock and maybe the two will communicate but that doesn't work like it doesn't the the scanner is scanning the rocks but it doesn't seem to be doing anything to the geolock and at this point morgan's like of course the rocks can't hack the geolock the encryption was was created by a quote twisted mind so if you're going to crack the encryption you're going to need another twisted mind Mm mm-hmm yep sure and guess his twisted mind that is it's morgan's he's so twisted jordan he's got a twisted mind i know i just thought this thing it was just such a lame way to get out of a problem so basically the plan is morgan will go back into the vr headset and he will hold a sunstone and hopefully the sunstone will interface with his brain and these his neural synapses will be faster than the scanner and the rocks will be able to hack the bio the the geolog via his brain which works he falls into a coma the sunstones hack the geolock get the abort code and essentially uh crack the encryption and we get to see everything disc basically de-petrify including the tarian yeah that old uh, kool-aid man tarian he finishes busting out of the wall and he's just fine and they're like oh good everything's good unfortunately in the time they were doing that i guess sunrise came because they've taken Yale and already put him into the steaming pile of earth and mm-hmm. uh, I guess his execution he's been lowered into the earth to die and while he's while he's being lowered in he's constantly pleading with Mary to like save him she's a human she understands that forgiveness is possible Tarians don't understand the idea of forgiveness mm-hmm. and I guess this works on Mary because as soon as Yale goes into the ground she decides to leave her Tarian friends and go into the ground after him and we see them like pop up out of the ground in a snowy field. She's rescued uh, Yale from his death. And the Tarians appear there too. And I guess they're annoyed that Mary didn't do what they wanted. So Mary's punished by they take away her Tarian powers and she's no longer allowed to go back into the earth. And it's explained really quickly by Yale because again, she can't really speak English. So they can't have her do the dialogue. So he's like, I guess what happened is they're punishing you for helping me. And then the only part that's really interesting of this is they have her like she's freaked out clearly because she's lost her powers so she runs off into the distance but there's a couple things one i don't think the actress can run very fast and two they have to have her run through snow so it's the saddest slowest running ever and i and and it was my favorite part of the episode was watching her slowly struggle to run away you love watching people run if they're if they're doing it badly But yes, uh, I guess the episode ends. Everyone's saved. The geolock is terminated. And Mary is exiled from the Tarians. I was a little confused. I was just like, well, they solved the geolock problem. So why are you so mad at Mary? But uh, I guess it's just to push a plot forward. Well, I'm glad that, yeah. Well, it's because she's going to come back later. But I like how these two episodes, <laughs> Morgan made this big problem. Yale uh, found out about himself. But the person who gets punished is Mary, this other character that had nothing to do with anything. I know. It's so it's so funny. And the episode kind of ends ends with like Yale's telling Devin about all the memories he has coming back to him but like she's like my name's Brandon Croy or Braden Croy but let's just call me Yale for now on because we've already established that <laughs> yeah he's like because the viewers aren't going to remember a new name <laughs> and then like we see Morgan's on kitchen duty like serving people I guess maybe that's his punishment and his hands are all hurt from holding the hot sunstones and like Danzinger comes up to him to like I guess say good work I forgive you for what you did because you saved us in the end but then also Danzinger like 
grabs his hands and squeezes them so he's in pain and then takes the last food so Morgan can't eat. So like I was just like, I don't understand. Are you forgiving him or are you punishing him? I don't understand. The sense I got was that he hadn't been punished at all. This was his mea culpa. He was on his own serving people to try to be like, guys, without actually saying sorry, he was trying to do something. And it's just showing that Dan Ziggers like, I don't care because I'm a I'm a big bully. Yeah, <laughs> that's what it sort of came off as like, wow, Dan Ziggers still a bully. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, that's it. That uh, wraps up our two part episode on on uh, Morganite, I guess. <laughs> Aren't you glad, though, that after this, in typical fashion for this show, we're just back to square one? They, they are desperate to not develop things, even though they give the appearance of it. I mean, I I at first was upset by that, but then I realized, like, I think it's just a sign of the times. Like, they just really can't let storylines go on too long. It, it's it's just a, it's just where TV was. It's just like, yeah. you've got to wrap things up for some Fair reason. Fair enough. Um, any final notes before we get to ratings? No, I think we go right into it. I did want to m- note one thing for you, though, Jordan, because I thought it was very funny. Is very early on when they're talking about Yale and his his bionics parts breaking down, someone said calls him a cyborg, and then Devin says, "Well, he's not a cyborg; he's a human being with peripheral enhancements." And that kind of semantic argument, I was just like, "That's perfect for this podcast." <laughs> <laughs> He's yeah. not a cyborg, even though I think repeatedly they call him a cyborg afterward. But I was just like, this is well, very funny. I mean, at what point, <laughs> we'll wrap this up, but at what point are you a cyborg? Did they call the the evil, those evil robot people who were clearly also prisoners that had bits put on them? They were cyborgs, weren't they? I feel like they did call them that. But it was just a really funny piece of semantics really early in the episode. I'm just like, what is the point of this? Other than like, this is what would be t- argued about on a podcast like yeah. ours. <laughs> Anyway, all right, let's 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 get into the ratings. What do you think of uh, Better Living Through Morganite Part 1? You know, uh, my rating slowly dropped as the episode went because, as I mentioned at the beginning of the podcast, it was really nice to come back to the show and to realize there is some care put into the show. There is some quality into the show from how it looks and from how it's acted and the special effects and everything compared to some other really crappy things we've seen. But... It's also super painful, and it, this show has this amazing ability to always maintain like zero momentum at all times. So I can't give it anything higher than a five and a half. Five and a half, eh? Well, yeah, we came back to it. I was trying to remember, you know, what was going on, what was what was happening, and one thing I really realized as I was watching this first episode, it really, as I came back to where we were in the series, I realized when we were watching before how my interest was shifting in the show, and it is that like. All the characters on the show are kind of self-serious do-gooders that aren't all that interesting. Like, they're they're too self-righteous for the most part, and, like, they're not a lot of fun. Well, to your point, I have a note here, which is, I wish there was one character I could root for and get behind. Well, and for me, there isn't one. And that's the thing, is I realized watching this episode, because it's so Morgan-centric, this is how my mind had been shifting watching this, is... I first hated Morgan because, you know, you're supposed to. And he's like such a Weasley guy with a hilarious haircut and like all that stuff. But as the series has been going on, he's really become a cartoon character. Just a coward, a weasel. He never learns anything. You always know he's going to do the stupidest move. And I remember that I had started growing to enjoy watching him because he was the most enjoyable character to me because I knew whatever happened, Morgan was going to do the dumbest thing possible. And that Mm -hmm. was very funny to me because he's just a cartoon and everyone else is so boring. And this episode was very Morgan centric. So when I was watching it, my girlfriend Melanie walked the room and she's just like, I hate that guy so much. He annoys me. Like, and she's right. Like everything he does, you can see coming a mile away. When they say they're going to put the geolock in the ground, you're like, oh, he's going to fuck it up. He's going to yeah. like ruin everything. And as she said, she hated him. She's like, do you know why? It's because he is like Mr. Bean. And I was like, he is. He's Mr. Bean. <laughs> you know everything Mr. Bean's going to do and you know it's going to be a disaster. And you're just sitting there waiting for him to do it because that's the comedy. Yeah. And I realized I like Morgan because he is this show's Mr. Bean. And I only want to see good. him Mr. Bean around this show. I don't care about the other characters. I just want to see him inconvenience and like annoy everyone. So he's the only thing I'm rooting for right now. And I'm going to give this a 6.5 because the fun part of this episode was watching him slowly get to the point where he was going to screw everyone over inevitably. We're not too far off there, but what do you think about the second half of this episode? So, as this t- second part of two-parters is always tough because it's not a full episode. Yeah, the second episode was like uh, the state, like they're racing against time to stop Dawn. It's just like every, all their plans really amounted to very little other than the one where they 
disconnect the geolock. Morgan was a little to the side here. I don't know. The whole thing was just like, it was a little less fun. It was just kind of like perfunctory wrapping it up kind of stuff. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to go, I think with like a, I'm going to give it a six, maybe a 5.5. Okay. I'm going to go lower on this. I was going to give it a 5.5, but the fact that they just had, they essentially solved the problem with magic at the end. I hate that sort of thing. It's like, so you maybe watch two hours of the show to be like, hey, you know, we solved the problem of uh, magic rocks. Why? How? Doesn't matter. Just keep watching these commercials, you idiot. Four and a half. Whoa. Very angry. It's just so, it's just so stupid. Like that was two hours of my time for magic rocks. Oh, whatever. All this stuff is magic, Jordan. <laughs> it's true, I guess. Well, Jordan, we're back. We're giving this show the same ratings we were before. Will mm-hmm. it improve? I don't know. I think it's going to hit that same five range no matter what. I mean, I think this winter subplot is going to be over. I'm hoping they find some new ground to cover other than just like walking forever once this like survive the winter subplot's done. I hope they just don't go back to like now we're walking toward New Pacifica again. I hope they kind of maybe get there. <laughs> Well, I kind of wish they hadn't killed Tim Curry's character and they hadn't brought him back right away and they could have saved him for later on, like points that now five, six episodes later, you could have brought him back as a fun character. But I guess we're waiting for what's his face? Uh, old guy from Lost. We're waiting for Terry O'Quinn, right? We're waiting for him yeah, to come yeah. back, I guess. I mean, I guess maybe that is the thing. Like, we love that character uh, played by Tim Curry. And, Gone. you know, I, I don't think I'm sure you don't feel the same way, but I'm enjoying Morgan because he's a dumb villain. The show really only works when its villains are having fun. Maybe, when our yeah. heroes are having fun, it's kind of boring because they're all not very engaging characters. Like they're just good. I'm hoping there's going to be like an erotic scene where uh, Devin and uh, Danzig are both getting a bath together. <laughs> Remember their one erotic scene where they had to get the water bottle off his belt? <laughs> I do. <laughs> That was wild. Yeah, that anyway, was bad. that wraps it up for this episode, I think. Um, after the credits this week, we're going to have a, another promo for the podcast Discussing Trek. Hosted, uh, The host will come on to tell you a little bit about it, but it's, it's a bit of a panel show to discuss his new Trek, old Trek, and talks about kind of how these uh, episodes fit in the canon and how they fit in our current world. It's an interesting show. I think you, could, I mean, you might enjoy it if you like our show. Um, also... If you want to talk to us about Earth 2, you can reach us at continuedrag at gmail.com. And of course, on Instagram and Twitter, we'll have some uh, clips from this episode. Probably Kool-Aid Man, right? Jumping out of that rock? Uh, Yeah, he might be in there. <laughs> what else could it be? Well, it could be what's your face going? La, 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 la. That's always good. Your favorite. That's You're my so favorite. good at it, too. They yeah, have. Not really. <laughs> Maybe mushroom cut walking around. But that about wraps it up. So, uh, listener, thank you for joining us. And Jordan, I'll see you next week. See you then. Continuum Drag is recorded in Toronto, Ontario. Theme music by James Rex Seedler, produced by Jordan Dulloch and Luke Black. Special thanks to Aaron Hughes. Hello everyone and welcome to Discussing Trek. I'm your host Clarence and I wanted to introduce you to the podcast. Discussing Trek is all about keeping you informed on the latest news and episode reviews in the Star Trek universe, while also staying engaged with our community of listeners. So be sure to hit that subscribe button for weekly content and stay locked in to DiscussingTrek.com for more information. Until next time guys, live long and prosper.